great you come up. Um, I'm bringing up uh, for you Adam Bosch. Um, Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress, if you're not familiar with it, is a regional organization that identifies challenges and promotes regional, equitable, and sustainable solutions to improve the quality of life in the Hudson Valley. To better understand the dimension of the housing problem and its implications, which I think Jen laid out beautifully, Pattern has been leading a leader in gathering and analyzing data and quantifying these trends and impacts on our region. Adam is the president and CEO of Hudson Valley Patterns, Pattern for Progress and is here to give us a snapshot of what that data tells us. Hey everybody, do you mind if I take this out of the stand? Is that okay? Sure. I'm, I'm a, my tallness creates problems, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold this. Uh, it's nice to see everyone, and Carrick did a, a great job of introducing what Pattern for Progress is. I won't go too much more into depth, but we have that pattern of something called the Center for Housing Solutions. Uh, and that center does a lot of independent research about housing around the region, but we've also done a lot of work for communities. So we wrote the Elston County Housing Action Plan, for example. We did similar work in Westchester and Rockland, and right now we're designing the Housing uh, Trust Fund for Sullivan County. So we're right on the front lines with all of you and trying to figure out how to tackle this crisis uh, that we have in the region. And that crisis has a lot of different dimensions, but for the sake of simplicity, let's say that the dimensions for now are housing affordability and housing availability. We don't have enough, and what we have is too costly for our neighbors, okay? So I wanna jump in and, and talk about what that looks like from a data standpoint. And then after I'm done going through the data with you, I'm going to talk about what some of the ramifications are of this housing crisis. So just starting off, this is home trends, so home sales trends throughout the region. You'll, all of you will remember 2018, the before times, as I like to call it, right? Uh, housing was a little bit more affordable back then. Uh, it's right around the time I bought my house here in Ulster County. And you can see what's happened from 2018 all the way, the way till now. Here we have just a dollar amount change in the median sale price of a home in every county throughout the region, and we have the percent increase. So what you see here, a couple things jump off, right? You see that Sullivan County is a county that's seen its median home price more than double over the course of that time, and you see that in the aggregate, just in the, in the dollar change, Columbia County has outpaced everyone in terms of the dollar change in the region. And what this means for uh, you know, a young family or someone coming into the region who wants to buy a house is that home ownership has sprinted away from people far faster than they can try to catch it. And right now, we like to talk about pathways of graduation, graduating from rentals into home ownership. That graduation pathway is essentially shut down in the region right now because of the cost and the unavailability of homes. Uh, and you'll see that low inventory, right? Inventory that's gone down by, on average, about two-thirds across the region. There's just not stock for sale. And if you go on and you just look for yourself, the stock that's for sale is one of two things. Very, very, very expensive or extremely bad shape. Okay, that's what's for sale right now across the region. So what does this mean? As I mentioned, cost of homeownership is out of reach. Median earning family, in every single one of the nine counties that pattern does work, the mortgage that a median earning family would qualify for falls $109,000 to $280,000 short of what they would need to qualify for to get the median price home. That's the gap, right? That's not a gap, that's a chasm, right? That's a big, big gap, okay? Uh, prices have pushed, pushed higher by the pandemic migration, right? Hudson Valley, even though we lost people during the pandemic, people don't realize this, but we lost on net basis in people. We did gain 60,000 people from the New York City metro area during the pandemic that moved up into the region. The interesting thing is just as many people from the region moved out of it during that time, mostly to the neighboring states and to Florida and the Carolinas. Um, experts say about 20 to 25% of all home purchases during that time were all cash. Uh, Supply is at historically low levels, as I mentioned, and we're not producing new housing. In this region, when you look at building permit data, since 2010, we've only built about 0.5 units of housing for every new job we attracted to the region. I don't have to tell you, that math doesn't work, right? It's really, really tough. We haven't kept up on the housing side. Now the production of housing is stifled by a lot of things interest rates, supply costs, labor, land costs, 
And it's important to understand that I go through some of the demographic data coming up, you'll see that we're looking at population shrinkage over the next several decades. So a lot of people will say, well, if you're looking at population shrinkage, why do you need more housing? Because part of the problem is, if you think about the population as being flat, if the pie is the same size, the typical size of the family in the Hudson Valley is getting smaller. People are having fewer kids. So if you're going to have roughly the same population, but the size of the typical family is smaller, that means you need more housing units to house a population the same size. You're essentially taking the same size pie and cutting it into more slices. Another thing that's happened, even though um, housing, as I mentioned, has gone up 60, 70, 80, 100 percent, you can see what's happened here in incomes, right? These are income quintiles adjusted for inflation. So the, this breaks uh, wages down into the lowest 20% of earners, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. And you can see mo in most counties, uh, the first two quintiles, the, the 0 to 40% of earners, have actually seen their purchasing power go down uh, relative to inflation over that time. So what this means is that people are being stretched on both sides of the equation, both on the cost and on the income. What does that mean? If that graduation path to home ownership is shut down, if it's strained, people are persisting in rentals for longer. And in some cases, they're persisting in rentals forever. And for some people, that's fine. That's great. My parents never owned a home. I grew up in a rental first 30 years of my life. It was great. But some people really would like to own a piece of their community because that's what happens when you own a home. So what you'll see here is renters are equally strained, right? This is the average hourly, I'm sorry, the median hourly renter wage in each of our counties. This is the housing wage that you would need in order to meet that important metric of a renter not paying more than 30% of their gross income toward rent. And this is the gap. So in every county, we fall short in terms of people either not making enough to afford that rent or the rent being too expensive for them to afford it, depending on which angle you want to look at it from. Um, here you can see what the wage gap is there, right? This is how, how much more money they would need to make in each of these counties in order to meet that 30% standard. So you see some places it's a fairly significant uh, gap. But even here, this is the one I always think is interesting. If you had two working renters living together, in most of our counties they can make it into a, a fair market rent situation, but the margins aren't big. So what does this mean, right? I experienced this in my life growing up in Newburgh. My dad worked at ShopRite. My mom was a uh, mail room worker. And what this means is that if you have to do something as simple as getting the cars changed on your tire, it's like a level five spin the red light emergency. You know, that's how the margins are right now for the renters who are living among us. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, here you can just see real quick a rate of change comparison. So on the left, this is how much wages increased over the past year and how much fair market rent increased. Now, fair market rent, just to remind everyone, that's the 40th percentile of all new rentals over the past two years. So it's not even average, it's not even median, it's below that, right? So this, this is an even more strained situation than it looks when you think about median rents or typical rents, okay? Uh, you can see here, generally the story is here, with a few exceptions, rents outpace incomes, just like home ownership costs have outpaced incomes as well. Okay, so just some general conclusions about rent, right? High cost of home ownership, making people persist in rent rents for rentals for longer. Uh, there's a lot of demand stress on the rental inventory as supply remains low there as well. Uh, the Hudson Valley is becoming more of a rented region than it used to be. This chart on the bottom shows the formation of all new households between 2010 and 2021. We formed two new renter households for every owner, owner household that we formed. So, we are increasingly becoming a more renter-heavy uh, region. Uh, median renter wages are starting to tick upward in some areas because as people persist in those renters for rentals for longer, it includes people making a higher income. It's important to understand the typical renter only makes about 40 to 60% of the area median income in any given county in the region. I talked about little money remaining for emergencies and some of this other stuff. I want to talk quickly about the ramifications of this. So, we put out a, a report earlier this year called The Great People Shortage and Its Effects on the Hudson Valley. And what it did is it really sort of try, it tried to get to the core of this workforce stress that we're feeling in the region. Because everyone in this room 
either yourselves if you're an employer or a friend, has found a situation where, hey, I'm having a hard time finding workers. Or, hey, I went to a restaurant that had a sign up in the front window that said, please excuse, please excuse us, we're understaffed. Some version of that. You called up, my favorite one is, I called up my doctor to make my annual physical appointment. They said, we're scheduling 10 and a half months out. I said, wow, 45 more days and it's not annual anymore. <laughs> That's workforce stress, right? That's the workforce stress that we're feeling across the region. That's a combination of a few things. Our births have steadily been on the decline, okay? Um, this is a global trend, not just a local trend right here. So here's the global trend. You can see all the major industrialized countries across the mm -hmm. world are now have their birth rates below the replacement rate. This is going to get a little morbid, I apologize. But 2.1 is where that blue line is. That's the number of children a typical family needs to have to essentially replace, that's the replacement rate to keep global populations flat. You can see here in New York, we're pretty well below 2.1, we're at 1.55, and you can see the way that births have gone down in the Hudson Valley. Uh, when births go down, so do school populations, right? So here's our school populations on the left before the Great Recession, on the right after the Great Recession. Two different stories on the left, you could essentially draw a line in Interstate 84. Everything north of 84 was shrinking, everything south of 84 was flat or modestly growing. Post Great Recession, we have five, uh, yeah, five of our nine counties, all their school districts are shrinking. And by shrinking, I mean like 10 to 49 percent. It's a lot, right? Uh, we have two, uh, two counties where only one or two school districts are moder moderately growing or flat. And then Westchester, you could cut in half, the northern half is growing, the southern half is shrinking. This is, you know, pretty stark. We have 34,088 fewer students going to school now than in, 20, 20, in 2003, okay? 97 of our 120 school districts are shrinking. Uh, part of that is because more people have left the region and come into it for 24 out of the past 25 years. This is migration data. Uh, IRS tracks it very carefully. These are people who moved out and moved into the region over time, okay? So for 24 of the last 25 years, with the exception of the first six to 12 months of the pandemic where we gained a whopping 700 people, uh, we have lost population outward migration. In the aggregate, it's a total of 134,505 people, okay? That's a lot of folks to lose over that period of time. Um, a lot of them are going just over the border to the neighboring states. Uh, many of them are going to Florida and the Carolinas. If you looked at this data a decade ago, there was a signal out to the West that's going away now. We're actually gaining more people from the West than we are losing to the West at this point. Um, but this is where people are going. This takes people out of the region. So, right, you pair up outward migration with births. This is a really tough situation for the region demographically going forward. We're going to do a very quick lesson in workforce math. This is our population in 2010, broken down by age groups. Our population in 2021, broken down by age groups. And when you start to think about the workforce stress in the region, it's good to start looking at these in terms of workforce cohorts. So I'll break it down this way. The prime working age cohort is generally thought of as 25 to 65. Some people will say 25 to 55, but we're going to say 25 to 65. You can see here that the older half of our workforce outnumbers the younger half by almost exactly 100,000 people. What that means practically is for every person that retires out of the labor force, we only have a fraction of a person replacing them on the younger side, okay? That leads to long-term labor force constriction. And that's why we're feeling this, hey, the hospital can't find employees, the warehouse place can't find employees, the school can't find employees, the restaurant can't find employees, because we're beginning to feel the leading edge of this wave, right? Now, you look at how this changes over time. Look at the difference in infants, children, and teens, just how that's changed over the decade in these data. In infants, we're down 5,000 from a decade ago. Uh, children, down almost 12,000. Teens, down another 5,000. Older teens, down another 5,000. We're down 26,335 additional young people just over the decade. Those people are going to age up into our workforce and cause further constriction absent additional outward migration, right? So what these data show is that this challenge we have in the region now gets worse over time, okay? And a lot of it has to do with housing. Going back one second, I won't go back, hold on. <laughs> uh, going back, thinking back to the um, migration data, when the U.S. Census Bureau 
uh, surveyed people from the Northeast about why they were leaving, housing was the number one reason, followed by job issues. But housing was far and away uh, the top reason. So what are the, what are the ramifications of this? There's a lot of ramifications of this. There's economic ramifications, labor shortages, upward wage pressure. We're starting to see businesses close locally, like the typical, think like the typical mom and pop downtown business, your dry cleaner, your diner, your auto body shop, places like that, because the baby boomer generation owner can't see a next generation person to pass that business along to, so they're liquidating. We're seeing that a lot across the region. A uh, stressor for business attraction. We've had really great success in this region at attracting businesses to come here. But guess what? There's a saying out there in the world, residential leads commercial. What does that mean? Businesses go where there are people. People go where there is housing. If we don't have housing for workers, we won't have workers for businesses. And our economic development set success could begin to fizzle as a result of that. We don't want to see that, right? Fewer consumers. Schools, right? We've had a very painful issue in the region. School building closures, right? Lots of districts have gone through it. We could see more of that. Um, school, di school districts told me all the time, they used to put out a, a position for a teacher, they get 40 applications in the 90s. Now they're getting like five or six or seven, right? Starting to feel their stress. Healthcare, big tension in the region in healthcare. We have a big aging population, we know that. As that population ages, the demand for healthcare services is gonna go up and up and up. But the number of people able and interested to work in healthcare is going down and down. And so there's this tension between the demand for the service and the supply of people able to provide the service. And that creates big, big tension in our regional healthcare system. Society, where are we gonna get volunteers for? Yes, the fire service, but also like literally, I'm coaching two soccer teams this year, and my son's not only one of them, because we didn't have enough coaches, okay? So that's a real, you know, real ramification. Uh, taxing, <clears throat> taxing and municipal finance. When we talk to Moody's and S&P, the rating agencies for this study, they don't like the number of our homes that are locked up in second homes and short-term rentals. Because they said, I'll put it simply, not everywhere is popular forever, right? So I apologize to my friends from Sullivan County who are, Sullivan County is the best example of this. If you wanted to run for president in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you had to visit Sullivan County where you could not run for president in the United States. Right? There's pictures of all sorts of presidents at Kutcher's and the Concord, right? But when, you know, when the Catskills became less popular and the hotel resort thing collapsed, Sullivan County kind of for a short time went down in that trough with it, right? So when the rating agencies look at the, the proportion of our housing that's locked up in second homes and short-term rentals, they're worried that there's not a sound enough foundation of full-time residents around to, make, to, to really pass the bonds, pay for the bonds, have a good solid foundation of payers for the long term. Um, we're going to talk about some of this stuff, I'm sure, throughout the day. Um, some of you have heard me say this before, but you know, just some fact check stuff. When people come out to our land use boards and speak out against housing and they say, we can't afford to have more kids in the schools. Nonsense. You saw the data, I can provide them with you if you'd like it. But this is the biggest myth going. We should be on our knees praying for a hailstorm of kids. Because if we don't have kids, we're not gonna have a workforce, folks. We cannot allow people to come and peddle this myth at our land use boards as a way to fight against really good developments. It's silly, and it's not based on real information, okay? Number two, people just don't want to work anymore. That's not true either. Our employment to population ratio is 58, 58.9%. That's higher than the 70s, 80s, 90s, and most of the 2010s, okay? Um, people are leaving New York because the tax is too high. This might be true, right? I mean, we see what it costs in the neighboring states. Taxes are 30 to 60% lower, depending on whether you move to Vermont, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, moving some of these places in the south, it's 60 to 85%. We haven't had a super <laughs> big conversation about taxes since the tax cut. Uh, if people are leaving New York, why do we need more housing? I mentioned that already. Uh, last thing I'm just going to show is this, right? Latest workforce survey, top big business challenges, 
attracting new workers, right? We know that's directly connected to housing. Here are the jobs that are hardest to fill in the Hudson Valley right now. You'll see those medical jobs, you'll see teacher, you'll see administrative jobs. If you have a CDL license in the Hudson Valley right now, you can essentially write your own paycheck. That's how many they're looking for. Um, really big challenges. I'll just end with this. Challenges ahead, we're here to talk about housing today. We know we don't have enough of it. We, don't, we know we don't have it at the right price point for the people that we need to live in our region. Child care, right, huge, huge challenge. We have a big report coming out of child care in December uh, from Pattern. College debt, between child care and college debt, typical families spending $2,500 a month on those things. Uh, the project review process and demographics. I know I'm out of time, so I'm just going to end on this. As we talk about housing, I just want everyone to remember that we're interconnected. I mentioned my dad worked at ShopRite for 48 years. My mom was a, a mailroom clerk. Um, I think everyone in this room wants to go to the grocery store and have their shelves fully stocked. I think everyone wants to call up their doctor's office and get their medical records transferred quickly, right? We want these goods and services that our neighbors provide to us, but too often we don't want the housing that allow these people to live in our neighborhoods so that they can provide these goods and services to us. So it's really important that when we focus on housing, we understand that we need housing for the full spectrum of incomes because we need housing for the full spectrum of people that play an important role in our lives. Okay? I hope that's helpful, and I'll be around. Thank you.